point uh, 50 miles south in Sunnyvale, so we're here in the um, I just wanted to thank all the organizers for giving me a chance to speak at this uh, forum. Uh, I've uh, been working with you are the newly, so I'm a newcomer, as all of you guys here, uh, just for the last few <coughs> years. And this is really going to is one of the more substantial projects I've been doing. You already heard from my colleague, John Pierre, who talked about sort of the context in which this work was done. Um, I'll focus completely on Pierre who was done here. So, we're really just going to talk about what the, sort of the background is, what motivated the problem, uh, define that talk about the solution, uh, walk you through a tutorial, a demo, and talk about some of the applications and potential applications, which is where I think it's quite interesting. And of course, uh, next step. So really, you've heard the buzzword, Internet of Things is everywhere. You cannot escape it, right? Have you, you have not heard it? All right, so what does it mean? Um, so there are really, you can break it down into categories. And, you know, the left side, which is what we call the consumer internet of things, is really what a lot of people get excited about. But that's actually the less interesting part. What we care about is what's more formally known as cyber physical systems. So this is the part on the right. And this is really things like self-driving cars, connected vehicles, medical systems, power plants, uh, energy distribution, um, <laughs> robotics, and so on. So that's really what we care about. Uh, we've been doing, so at RTI, we're a spin-off from Stanford, we've been doing this for the last uh, 20, 20 years, and so this is kind of our core strength. Uh, we came out of the aerospace and robotics background, my background itself in robotics, and uh, so we have projects, and all of these pictures you see are customer projects, RTI customer projects that are given us permission to expose them. So uh, you can see that, you know, the powers, power in this room, this is the Western grid. The largest hydroelectric power plant in the United States is, is running, again, this control system built around this technology that I'm going to talk a little bit about or make sure in the context here. So this is sort of the background. Now, what does RTI provide? So we provide really a distributed data bus or a connectivity platform. And it's really a data-centric connectivity platform. And it's not about just at the IP level, but think about going up a couple of there. So it's not just about the messages, it's really about sending data. And data can have state, can be streaming, can have some context, has some structure. So really we think about it as a connectivity platform that gives you syntactic interoperability. So you are sharing structured data between participants who may be really anywhere on any type of platform. Uh, so you can see sort of that here graphically, and uh, that's, that's what we provide. And of course, in the context of cyber physical systems, where they have to operate in the real world, and if there's a failure, there's usually loss of life or property, usually in both. Um, and, and the right answer delivered too late becomes the wrong answer. You know, all these are sort of critical aspects. So that's what we provide, our character next. And it's built around an open standard called DBS. How many of you have heard of DBS? Okay, great. I saw some signs for DDS just next block, and it was Dr. Benjamin Sutton. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, you can read more about this standard. I'm not going to go into details uh, on that either. Okay. So, what, you know, why are we talking about UA and why am I here? And what we did, did we start, you know, why didn't we even start looking at UA? So, really, if you look at DDS and sort of the way we built our platform, it's built around the idea of a shared data space. The participants, you know, these components, the green boxes, they can interact with the shared data space and exchange structured data. Okay, so the data itself is organized as uh, data models uh, or defined through data models, and these are data objects that are being shared now. The way again we, we do this is there are no servers or brokers in the system, so the communication itself is peer to peer, it's a logical shared data space that we that we create. Uh, but that aside, because that relates to the factors of performance and scale and availability and so on, uh, here in this context, the problem is, okay, you've got some shared data space, you know, the operations in John Pierre, I think, talked about that yesterday, you know, data writers can write into this data space, and then the system, the data bus, makes sure that you have eventual consistency and state 
uh, updates being propagated to all the local caches and the different components. And you can then take a different data space using operators that you would take. So, now, the interesting part is this is all structured data. You can have any number of components, discoveries built in, components come and go, and things get discovered at the right, which is right. Starts with the right place in the right. So that's sort of what, what the core is, but let's get back to the idea of data. Right? So now, in reality, I mean, people write these systems using, I mean, there, there's a variety of platforms from you know, VxWorks and Integrity and like, you know, metadata systems, you may have never heard those names I use, or QMX or any of those, to sort of the familiar operating systems that everybody uses and the cloud stuff, to, you know, something custom, you can have people doing custom operating systems. And then, of course, the choice of running languages. And I was very happy to see the theme, you know, part of, you know, highlighted that yesterday in this plenary talk. You know, you want to pick the right language for the right problem. If you're doing real-time control and you're doing tight control loops and controlling some machinery, that's probably an RTOS. If you're doing graphical user interfaces, you might go with something like that or, or, or here, right? So, um, you know, different, but, but now all of these different components in the distributed system need to talk, and again, the link of front is the data, right? So, so you're getting back to the idea of, of having a shared data model and a shared data space, right? So, now, those data objects are described by some data model or data types, as we say. So that's kind of shown here. Okay, and this is an example. Actually, it looks like C or C++, but it's really a language called IDL, or Interface Definition Language. It's really a subset that really focuses on the data aspect parts of it. Right? So it's focusing on um, just sort of defining structure of information. And of course, you know, the, the DDS standard itself has an entire definition or spec which is an exercise specification which very much goes into the greater detail of defining really the kind of data types that you would use. Uh, you know, so these can be very well then nested complex data structures right? where you describe all kinds of uh, different things you come into the problem. Right? And then the language that you would use is either IDL or XML to define these data types in a programming neutral manner. Okay, so now, traditionally with static languages, we can map these using the code generator to you know, the right header files for C, C++, or the right class files for Java or .NET, and you can pretty much see how that static mapping is going to work. Now, what about dynamic languages? For example, now we want to write a component in Lua. So John Perro was talking about this. So we've added a Lua interface to the DDS system, and a very simplified interface, but extremely effective and powerful for working with the data space. And people like it because you can do validation, you can do data generation of all kinds of interesting things. But back to the data, right? How do you work with structured data in that? Right? And what is that mapping? Right? So what does the data model really do? Well, it puts a constraint on the space of data objects you can create that adhere to that schema or right? So it's it's a constraint. So that that's been in static languages being enforced by a compiler. But now, in the case of Lua or dynamic languages in general, what, how, how do you enforce it? Right now, in general, this is the problem with dynamic languages, but in, in case of Lua, you know, that's the focus here. Right? So uh, now Lua has something really nice, of course you guys know, meta, or meta tables and all of that. So really this whole sort of framework is built out using a lot of meta programming, uh, the Lua tables. Okay. So the solution is, uh, I call it a DDSL is the acronym, and for, to, to give it some meaning, I, I expanded it to data domain specific language. Uh, it's really a way of describing data types in Lua. Okay. Um, so what DDSL does is it keeps, it allows you to define the data models and define a template. So you could use, you could have used uh, IDL or XML, but you can now use also Lua to define your data models. It allows you to then create instances from those data models that are kept in sync with the data models and enforces those constraints and keeps these instances synchronized. Um, so that's basically what it does. And it also gives you the indexing of the data models so that if you had a data store and you had a complex data type with many nested fields, you get a, a string accessor that allows you to index that data uh, data item in the data uh, data type or in a data store, and that's what we use. For example, as we start working with 
complex data types in the in the UR connector that John Bear talked about. This. So that's the idea basically here. And now what makes it interesting is that these are kept synchronized. So if you add a new fit in the data model and you have hundreds of instances already, each instance will automatically get that additional field and and that field will show up at some default value. Okay? Which will be the stream accessor. Of course, with Lua, you can just see this type of, right? Of course, now, it keeps the entire meta model, so for each of the fields, you can also introspect, walk through the data model itself. You can uh, uh, you can see what the underlying type is, is and, and so on. Um, now, uh, the other thing is that if you wanted to add a field directly here in the Lua instances, it is only allowed if the field exists in the underlying table. So uh, structural constraints are enforced. So if the underlying data model says you can have these three fields, only those three fields would be allowed, or those four fields would be allowed here. Right? So if you wanted to add a Z here, that would not be allowed. So structural constraints are enforced. And the framework is there to enforce the additional type of constraints if you wanted to. Uh, now, data models, of course, can be very complex, right? So this is kind of a uh, high-level organization into really three categories, right? There's the primitive data types, so those are your atomic ones, like on double string, and so on, and the x type spec, IDL, and so on, have these defined, there's constants, there's enums, enums get actually tricky uh, uh, to map, uh, and then structural, uh, Organization, the composition of those things, so these can be structures, structures can be structures of structures. Of course, they can contain unions, unions can contain structures and more unions, so it can be a very complex, right? The unions have this connection and so on. And of course, then you can also compose them into sequences, which are very, very structured with some capacity and length, or arrays, and of course, they can be multi dimensional. So you can see that the data models can get very complex. Right? And of course, on top of that, there are some facilities for organizing things, such as such as type tabs, we do like to alias things, and of course organize them into namespaces, and perhaps even add annotations, for example, we could use those small ranges or define if the data type is sensible or not, and, and so on. Uh, beautiful. So, so it is actually quite complex, right? The, the, the space of these data models that, that you have. Right? So, so if you didn't have, you were working in a Lua environment, and you could, of course, the you know the problem of uh, so if you were working in a Lua environment. Um, the data type, of course, has to be maintained outside the scripting environment, and it's not accessible without DDSL. And it must be known to you, the programmer, so there's no way to write some automated algorithm that discovers the data type, which, for example, DDS, DDS allows you to do, and based on that, automatically map it to something else. Right? So that kind of automatic mapping would not be done. You'd have to hand code it, and you could not write so that, that, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, you know, because now the programmer's knowledge is hard coded in the program, it's an error code, and so on. And of course, the data types change, it's brittle, right? And of course, if a script wanted to introduce new data types and new topics, it could not do that because it has no way of sort of defining those things. So that's that is the situation without DDSL. And, and so you know, and all you have is basically those string indexes into a complex data type, and you have to compose them by hand because you really don't have a way of accessing that data store, right? So, so now with DDSL, this, this data type can be maintained inside the scripting environment. Uh, it's fully accessible to the program, okay? The data type need not be known to the programmer uh, explicitly, so if you, it discovers the data type you know, your script discovers this data type from somewhere or reads it from a file, it can automatically do operations with it. There's, there's basically one single version of truth rather than having sort of multiple versions. And it can all be tied back to the same underlying data model. And essentially now a script can introduce new, new uh, data into the data space. Right, so here's a quick example. I mean, all that was a little bit abstract, so what do you mean? Right, so here, there's the data model IDL example up here on the on the right, on the top right. And what we want essentially, you know, you a simple one, but this is what you think the data object in Lua would look like, which is which is good. Um, now in DDSL, you can essentially insert using IDL, use IDL, and then you could export it to XML and then import that XML into DDSL, or directly define it in DDSL. 
just like that. So this is this is sort of a way of defining data models. And note that these data types, like x types are long, refers to an x type data type in the x, x type specification. Right? So it's not the Lua primitive types. These are primitive types defined in your modeling system. Right? So you have a modeling language, you have a modeling paradigm, and in that, those are the data types we're defining and annotating and, and keeping in sync. So that's sort of the underlying um, requirement. Right? And then, of course, in terms of data objects, what you do is from that shape type, and notice the capitalization, that's the model or template, sometimes it's called, and then this is this is the local instance. We say, okay, get me a new instance that adheres to that model. And now the shape type, essentially, if you do you know an iterator on it, will unfold like this, it'll look like this. If you unpack it, that's what it'll look like. But underneath there's a meta table that links it to that underlying shape type, and those constraints are being enforced. So now you can operate on it just like a normal table but it is constrained. And where it gets interesting is when this structure gets very complex, right? The nesting and things like that. So um, it gives you some very natural iterators here. Okay, so it opens up some new possibilities because now, um, you know, it can be fully examined in Lua. Um, you, can, uh, you can essentially manipulate a data type. So previously, I mean, you would have to define it in ideal, it's static. Um, and essentially now you can essentially create, read, update, modify your entire data model. Uh, you can synthesize it. You can actually now compose data models if you knew what you were doing, but you had some operators for doing that. Um, and you can of course automate code generation, or you can automate data generation. So it gets, gets interesting. And of course you have the full power and flexibility of Lua available to you. So you could say, well, this field is this, uh, you know, it is a floating point number or a string or this based on some other requirements. Or yeah, so you can pretty much compose your data model or synthesize it. Uh, and of course, it brings data types to every IoT platform. And, and, and uh, because DDSL itself is a for pure Lua, and so it's platform independent, and Lua pretty much runs everywhere, right? Um, so, uh, so even web browsers, right? So we, we played with uh, Lua VM .ts. I think we have the authors here. Yes, they are. And I think we had some interaction with you. John Mayer was actually interacting with you. And, and we got it to work in, in, in that environment as well. And, and uh, uh, you know, we had we built a little tool that had a browser-based front end. So this was quite useful there for validation of data types for user input because the user was going to essentially make entries for the data, to, uh, data values. And you had to make sure that you were creating a form that was exactly the right form. So kind of fits into that. Use case. Okay, so let's see. What exactly is DDSL? Right? So there's really five high level points I would make here. One is it's, you can think of it as a replacement for ideal. So it's just another language for defining data types, have to speak to us, so you've got the full power of Lua. Number two, you can think of it as a factor of data objects of instances that adhere to a data type, of course, as defined in the modeling paradigm. Third, it's an algebra. To operate on data types and maintain the associated data objects and instances and keep them in sync. And finally, it is also a generator of accessible strings for indexing members in a data object store. So you can use that to essentially create your own simple table. And we're talking about simple tables just vanishing in a compiled language. Well, now you can bring them back. Um, and it, it builds that simple table for you if you want to think of it in those terms. Right. And it's really an extensible framework for data modeling. So you can, you know, so the core engine itself is independent of X types. And then you can sort of build your data modeling paradigm on top of it. So, okay. so let's go through these points a little bit. Right. So uh, ideal replacement for Lua, essentially, uh, you know, it has, for instance, features that are in X type spec, but not in ONG ideal, which is being changed. So and we just added those. You, know, you can import data types from IDL um, by generating an XML and importing that XML. So it has the utilities with an XML parser, so you can import it to DDSL. That was a necessity for us to actually build, build a product. Um, and, and of course, you can take a DDL specification like the one I showed, showed you, and you can generate IDL back from it. So you can essentially have a full round trip IDL, XML, DDSL. And of course, you can easily define new kinds of data types. So uh, the core primitives of the underlying DDSL engine themselves uh, can be used to, for example, define a new type of uh, composition if you want. 
there are two types uh, of uh, defining, two ways of defining data types. So what I showed you earlier was this one. Uh, I called it a declarative type, essentially. So this is the constructor approach. And essentially, this is a uh, constructor um, you know, with, with some uh, you know, x types are struct. It basically gives it the flavor of a struct. Okay. And then essentially, you are defining uh, a constructor there. Um, and, and it looks sort of natural if you were used to idea of C structs. Uh, and and uh, pretty much then, you know, that builds essentially something that has the form of a struct. Right? This is the other um, approach uh, which you can take, which is an embedded approach. So you can say, okay, I'm defining a constant. It's a constant, max scale of length, x times dark const. And then you're defining essentially the name of the const itself. And it happens to be a long, and max length is 128. Right? And then here you are saying, okay, I'm going to create a struct. I'm going to create an empty struct. So it's just like, uh, you know, an empty struct, I'm going to add start adding fields. So the first field I'm going to add is an x field, which is an empty which is a long. Second field I'm going to add is, is y, which is a long. Third field I'm going to add is another long. Fourth field I'm going to add is a color field, which happens to be a string of this max color length. So now you can see how you're referencing different data objects or different, different Lua uh, model elements that you're defining in ESL. So now we're building essentially a data graph right, or data model graph. Right, so this is referencing that max color length I was defined to essentially be, uh, you know, essentially a constant with 128, um, value 128. And of course, uh, you know, you can have this, uh, there's some annotation called, it's a key field. So think of this as an annotation, which is basically used to identify instances in the data space. So this, that, that's a little bit more unique to the aspect. It just is like marking key fields in a, in a table. Um, now, notice that these two are equivalent. And actually, when you do this, underneath, this is what happens. Right? So this is just really, really a constructor that, you know, all it really needs is the name of the structure defining. So you can say it's, you know, this is a binding of the name to essentially an empty, empty data type. So just like UI has an L, PDSL has X types are empty, which is basically sort of, you know, where you start with, and then you can grow from there. Right? Or you're binding into something that's not empty, but underneath that's what it's doing. All right, so, all right, and of course, uh, so it is a factor of instances. So instances are constrained by the data type, and of course, arbitrary things cannot be added. Um, it does not enforce, like, so if I define a field to be a long, I can put a string value in the Lua instance, because that would be too much overhead to check. And usually it's not an issue, but somebody could easily add a constraint checker like that. <coughs> what it does enforce is a structural constraint. So I'm not gonna, it's not gonna allow you to add a new field that was not in the line model. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the trade-off uh, there. And of course, bounds are enforced. So if you have collection bounds like arrays or sequences and you tried, you said, you know, this was a max, that you know, capacity of 25, you cannot add a 26 element to that essentially table because it's constrained by that data model. Um, and, and so what you get is that the performance itself of using that instance uh, data object is pretty much at par. Um, and you can use it because all the fields are created. The meta tables are only going to be accessed when you're trying to add a new field or essentially of, you know, there's some operator overloading when you're trying to essentially insert something into a collection, okay. which seems reasonable. Um, so, as a factor of instances, you know, this shape type is equivalent to that, and of course, you can iterate to to a new instance that you created for that shape type into like this. So your shape is is a Lua table with that, you know, which basically has that structure. So I was just showing you the iterator, and that's what you can get on the output. And so. Um, all right. Now, in terms of data type algebra, okay. So I said it's a data type algebra. So, okay. So things can be manipulated in ideal and XML, and of course, um, uh, you can you can uh, you know, if you are going to change your data model, for instance, add a new field. I don't think about that. It's going to get propagated. So I'm gonna uh, keep moving a little bit. Um, so underneath, so this is basically the type you're defining. This is using the x-type operators. 
and then use this to create essentially a table that adheres to that. And um, there are some model operators here. And of course, underneath they're all backed by the table. So I'm going to, and then of course, you can you can see so the example of that. I, I think I'll skip this forward and I'll show it to you in a, in a uh, tutorial. So you know, these are accessors that get automatically uh, generated. And of course, it's an extensible framework. So as I said, CoreGen is, is independent of, of uh, IDL or, or uh, X times. OK, so let's see. I think I'm going to kind of show you, but it's there in the slides. So if you want to look into the details, and then you've got operators for model elements, for instances, helper methods, and so on. So let's jump to the tutorial. This is available on GitHub. Uh, and basically, I'm going to just quickly run the tutorial here. You're going to have the time to finish it. Um, but what I'm going to do is, OK, so I've already set that up. And the way it's intended to go to the tutorial, there are some helper functions, but the source code is here. And pretty much, um, you know, it walks you through, and the idea is you look at the tutorial source, you look at the output, so you kind of understand what's going on. So it's a very simple example of defining a const, and then you know we're going to run that one, and this one is basically going to, yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Oh. So, um, so this is really just saying, okay, I've defined a const and show data type just simply prints it. Um, and of course, you can use the operator again. This is overloaded to essentially get the value and the underlying data type of this constant because this was essentially a constant that you're defining x types, and and then you can print out the value, which is 1.8, and the underlying data type of the long. So this is really just showing showing that here. Okay, so you know this is a little bit more complex. This is the shape type I, I talked to you about. The show data type is essentially showing it. I made an idea up here. And then, of course, you know this is a, another one that's showing the embedded example I talked about. And of course, that's here. Right? Then the next one is importing from XML. And this is uh, that XML that I have here has basically a, a JSON definition as a data type. And then essentially that shape type in XML. So it just imported that and did that out as IDL. So kind of get a feel for what's going on here. And hopefully, I mean again, this should all be as we expect. And then of course you have some model operators here, adding numbers, removing numbers, redefining things, adding a base class to a class, and you can see all those operations happening. And then now you've added a base truck, and of course the instance you would create from that has those. So everything is sort of the same. And then you know, you've got operators that let you walk with instances. Um, all right, so um, let's see. Um, you know, instance iterators, there's, uh, okay, this one is a little bit more interesting. This is number 11. This is instance and nested structs. So I'll go here. And this one, what it does is, it says I'm going to define a shape type and then I'm going to extend it. So it's defining an extended type, and then you can see that you know these these are getting more complicated data types with the property values here. Right. So uh, you know essentially it's we've defined a property here, it looks like that, and then of course the data type looks like this, and then if you create an instance, you will see you have the accessor fields for the values, and then of course you create a new instance and initialize all the values and then keep it track. Okay, right, so I think uh, I'll switch back to the presentation. I think we have two minutes. Okay, so uh, in terms of applications, who's using it? Well, we shipped our product, uh, or it's an experimental research project, uh, product, again, which I've been working on, which is uh, a data emulator. So once you define components and 
to find the component interface in, in a data centric architecture, you can now really have anybody build this component. Right? So the whole idea is integration with disparate components and, and making it easy and lowering sort of the speed of doing that and the cost. Um, so this data emulator essentially takes an interface that's defined and essentially uses this to do uh, essentially uh, data generation and emulation. So we've used it again, very complex data types uh, <coughs> that our DOD customer had, and so they've been uh, using it. Then now one of my colleagues um, added React, uh, support for reactive programming. So he added data generators. Now once you have the data models, you can now say, okay, I'm going to sample this space, okay, and then create an instance. So you can now create a data generator. Of course, you can put constraints on it, so it gets quite interesting. Now, potentially, there are some new applications that can happen. Of course, it would be exciting to see new data models, but it's using this. So, and you can synthesize the data models. Of course, data serialization, digitalization, and with the new sort of operators for, you know, bit manipulation, I think this will get quite interesting. Um, core generation, model mapping and synthesis, and, and so on. So, that's really sort of all I have. There's more, of course. So it's just a sort of uh, very high level overview. So there's the readme, there's the doc documentation, there's unit test. I'll kind of just um, point you to the GitHub page. It's right here. All the links are there. And then, of course, you've got your your uh, doc here. So you can, you can look through this and you can see all the different, uh, different things. So thank you very much for your attention. And sorry if there was a little bit rushed at the end. But questions? Yes. So, I don't think you mentioned it, but if you're going to replace IDL, IDL can generate constraints for many different languages, not just Lua. So, if you're going to replace IDL, you have to still be able to yeah. generate everything that IDL could. Yeah, so, my, uh, so I was actually not saying replacing IDL necessarily, okay. but I was saying that it can be used as a replacement for IDL and as a better IDL, because IDL is static, right? And Lua, if you think of Lua as really a specification language, right, and not think of Lua necessarily as, you know, so you can think of this as a better IDL, where you actually have capabilities of composition and generation in your modeling language itself, which would otherwise, which is not right. otherwise possible. It's a little bit different. I understood yeah. that IDL can take a general <coughs> and turn it into C code. Yes. Now we could use this to write a code generator to do exactly the same thing. Okay. That's, what That's what I meant. Right? This is an equivalent specification, except it's a lot more malleable. Okay. That's, yeah, that was a chunk. Yeah. Uh, do you deal with the evolution of the data model by any chance? Well, uh, I don't think anybody really fully deals with it today, but I think that's at the end of the state of the art, and that's something I'm personally quite interested in. Uh, and this, I think, will help with that. So. Anybody else? Any comments? All right, thank you very much.